You're listening to the Sisterhood of Limitless Living podcast. I'm your host, Dr. April Moreno. I'm a public health specialist focused on integrative wellness and autoimmune living, supporting the community of women, where I help you to live your best quality of life through being your best self-advocate. Let's get started. Hello, Sisterhood. Welcome to another episode of the Sisterhood of Limitless Living podcast. We are in May now, and it's it's a really exciting time because it's our one year anniversary. The podcast is one year old. It's our birthday. And this month, we are celebrating all month long in various ways. We are doing an online event coming soon. I'm still planning it out, but I'm hoping to have something pretty fun and something that speaks to the community of women in autoimmune living and thriving as a whole. So follow us on Dr. April Wellness at Instagram, at Dr. April Wellness, where most of the activities will take place. I've just been finding that Instagram is the most fun. I love Instagram. I get the most feedback, the most interaction, and it's fun to put out images, photos, diagrams, charts, graphics on Instagram. And I just have a very supportive community on there. So the sisterhood is also on Twitter at SL3 Limitless. However, it's very quiet, but we do reach out every so often to people who are struggling through the autoimmune experience, or we find a lot of news articles, a lot of great resources about policy and public health, and also associations related to autoimmune diseases on there. A great group is like Looms for Lupus. Another great group on there is the called the Spoonie Chat. Hashtag Spoonie Chat. There's some really good, fun communities on Twitter as well. However, my favorite is, again, Instagram. If you join, follow me at Dr. April Wellness. You'll find out much more information about the Sisterhood of Limitless Living in a very fun light. And hear more about the celebrations that we're about to partake in throughout this month online, virtually. We were planning to do something in LA. I was looking at something like Second Home in downtown LA, but... Of course, with the pandemic, everything's pretty much shut down now. And so we are going to just work on it creatively and remotely. So this episode is for the month of May. We are looking at this theme of health equity. I've been working on two podcasts. Uh, This is my long-term podcast, The Sisterhood of Limitless Living. Long-term meaning a whole year has passed. The other one's new. It just started a month ago. It is because of the pandemic. And to continue to share perspectives and information about public health, policy, and culture with a multicultural approach from around the world, that's called COVID-19 PPC. And it's also located everywhere. Podcasts are located like iTunes, Spotify, all of it. So that one's more short term. Both of my podcasts, the month of May is dedicated for the most part to health equity and understanding the various factors and things that are involved in health disparities and also promoting diversity and inclusion in healthcare. So in this episode, we're actually going to be talking to a couple of ladies who have their own podcast as well. It's called Myelin and Melanin, and they are from the multiple sclerosis community. And this is a conversation for the most part. Other episodes in the past have been more of a interview format. Uh, It's kind of structured that way, but it, it turned out to be much more of a conversation as we just talk about health equity, COVID-19 even, and multiple sclerosis. So as a researcher, a lot of my work has been, during my podcast, my postdoc, those words are so similar. Postdoc years have been on multiple sclerosis, online patient research networks, and diversity, patient experience. And so we talk a little bit more about that as well in this episode. So yeah, this conversation kind of goes in a lot of different directions. 
we start off with talking about multiple sclerosis, the types of medications that are out there. We talk about treatment and experiences in the community. We talk about access to care. We talk about COVID-19. And then we start going into this topic of research and health equity for healthcare even in general. So I hope you enjoy this episode. You're welcome to join in the conversation as well on Instagram, which has definitely quickly become my favorite online social media location looking into a membership format for the sisterhood community on facebook so we're working on that kind of a redesign at this point but anyways i hope you enjoy this episode it was fun to have the conversation it does get a little sad it gets a little serious as we talk about disparities in healthcare and covid and research all of it but just know that we have some control over what's going on out there we have a voice and we have to stay vigilant and remain our best self-advocates. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Today, we have two amazing ladies out there in the autoimmune community. We've got Dana and Dawn of the Myelin and Melanin podcast, and they talk about various topics related to MS and everyday living. And welcome, Dana and Dawn. And hi, uh, hi there. Thank you for having me. Tell us about you. Tell us about your podcast. This is Dawn. I am one of the co-hosts of Myelin and Melanin. And we started our podcast back in 2018 now. Yep. Yeah. So we have three seasons. We are currently in our third season right now. I have MS. I was diagnosed in 2000. That's that's kind of what sparked the uh, the whole idea with Dana and I. We both talked about it and just said, "Hey, let's let's do this. <laughs> let's start yeah. a podcast." Mm -hmm. And I'm Dana, um, the other co-host of Myelin and Melanin, and I was diagnosed with MS in 2000, March of 2004. I was 23, going on 24. That's us. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about your podcast. What topics have you discussed in there? Yeah, like Dawn said, so we're in our third season. So our tagline, if you will, is we're just two Black women sharing our musings on life and mess and everything in between. And so with that said, you know, we primarily talk about MS and how it impacts our lives. But we also talk about the quote unquote in between. So, you know, current events and other things that are going on that shape our lives and also how race and being black women impacts our lives as well because that's a whole other reality when you're dealing with chronic illness like ms and our current series right now is on self-acceptance and and self-love and how intimacy impacts you when you have an autoimmune or disease or when you have multiple sclerosis. And we've had, let me see, how many episodes are we in now, Dana? We have had we one, are two, on three, layer four now, right? Four now. Yeah. 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 Everything seems to be unfolding naturally and in the midst of all of the pandemic, we're happy to be safe at home. And so just to um, piggyback off of what Dawn was saying about the series, the series is entitled That Part. Um, intimacy and MS. So as John said, we're starting out talking about self-love, self-acceptance and all those things, but how they nurture an intimate relationship. So as we're progressing, we're kind of moving on into how we talk about sex and sexuality as it relates to MS as well, because that's not a topic that is often discussed as it relates to people with any sort of chronic illness or disability. So it's kind of interesting how that's unfolding. All of that talk will start in May. So yeah, so I encourage people to, to check it out and see how things unfold. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, I mean, that's part of everyday living mm -hmm. and we do need to address all aspects of our lives. Yes. So yes. I'm glad that you're both comfortable getting into those subjects and so looking forward to hearing yes. your discussions there you also talked about i believe dana just mentioned the reason for your podcast and the reason that i also invited you here today and the theme of may in this podcast is to talk about 
race, health equity, and autoimmune disease, and how we live and navigate all these different layers of living, um, and then how it affects our, our health and our quality of life. What have we seen? What have we had to deal with? What can we navigate? And how can we help other people get through some of these challenges? Today, I would love to get a little bit more into detail about these topics. And so first of all, I would just love to hear how you've both been doing during this time of the pandemic. What has it been like to live with an autoimmune condition, in this case, MS, in this season of the pandemic? Mine's kind of quick, but I haven't been affected um, retrieving or getting going to the pharmacy to get medications. My doctors are all readily available by phone, email, and if I call and they're not available, they call me right back, which is great. The only thing that I was kind of bummed about was my neurologist canceled my appointment for May and pushed it back to June. And we had, this was the third time we pushed it back, which is fine. And just because I, I love her so much, she's a great, great doctor. I'm not like rushing us to get back to a sense of quote normalcy, but um, I what do. That's going to look like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just enjoy talking to her about my progress and just how I'm feeling overall and things like that. I just, I guess in my brain, I'm so used to being on schedule. And Dana and I were talking about this yesterday. I'm so used to sticking to our six month, every six month appointment and our once a year MRI or my once a year MRI. And so now all of this is thrown off. So that's, that's really been the only thing that I'm juggling in terms of health. I'm pretty healthy and I feel good. And as long as I stay away from, you know, the major places like the grocery store and things like that. I mean, I go at the proper hours or the appropriate hours for the elderly and immune compromised. So I haven't had an issue. And of course, I'm wearing a mask and gloves and I'm in and out. I've been wondering about that. Have people looked at you? Have they looked for like signs of disability? Like what has it been like to go in during those hours? In the morning. The first, the first time there were armed guards at the door and like, oh my goodness, it's not that serious. And I had to prove that I had MS and I, I wear like a medic alert bracelet or whatever. And I was like, look, I have MS. You can, you can call my doctor, you can call whatever numbers on here and, and ask to verify. She was like, no, 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 it's fine. And then second time I went in the cashier and another lady that was in front of me said, um, oh, you look mighty young. How did you slip in here? And I know they were being, they were, they weren't being mean or anything. They were just wondering. And I had to say, oh, I have MS. So the very, the first time and the second time, you know, I'm trying to explain myself. But after yeah. the first minute or so, it was fine. So for me, um, well, first of all, I haven't been out of my house since beginning of March. So that feels good. It's an oddly comforting feeling. However, so the disease modifying therapy that I am on for my MS, it's called Ocrevus, and it's an every six month infusion. And the thing about Ocrevus is that it is an immunosuppressant drug. So without getting into a lot of details about it, it is something that obviously compromises the immune system. So I was originally scheduled to have my six month infusion in March. And it was actually like right before things started to get really chaotic as far as COVID goes. And so I had asked if they could reschedule my infusion because I just didn't feel comfortable. And so my infusion actually is now rescheduled for May 8th, which I'm going to reschedule because that's still too early for me as far as I'm concerned to to get that and to deal with the ramifications of being even more immunocompromised. So it's scary. It's like you take a calculated risk. Okay, do I go and get this infusion and deal with the ramifications of being even more immunocompromised? Or am I taking, well, not or, but I am taking a risk with my health and not getting the medication that I need to 
keep my MS under control. So it's scary. Yeah, these are interesting times. Just even any other type of non COVID related health condition. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking the other day, my tooth was feeling a little loose. I don't even know what people do if they need to go to the yes. dentist anymore. Yes. yes. Anything. I have a wisdom tooth that I've been putting off for years getting taken out. I had a flare up of that wisdom tooth and a really bad toothache the other day and I'm like even if I was going to go to the dentist to get it taken out like I couldn't right. so it yeah these are scary times I've yeah. seen memes and people like have said don't do this or use a knife properly because we are not going to the ER if you cut yourself <laughs> right yeah Don are you on the same infusion or are you on a different medication are you taking uh, DMTs no, my last DMT was in 2017. I took Lemtrata, which was fine for me. My round one was 2016. My round two was 2017. So there is research out there about how these drugs affect you years later, but I don't know off the top of my head right now how it, how it would affect me because it has been years. I feel feel like my immune system is is strong right now. Get labs done every are drawn every month and they check those numbers and take samples and things like that. So, so far so good. I, again, I know just because I'm feeling fine and, and Lemtrata worked for me, that doesn't mean that I can just be reckless and still walk around without a mask or anything because I still have MS. And so I have to be careful with all of everything. Yeah, I find it really interesting that some of the medications that they're looking at for treatment of COVID-19 are related to the autoimmune community, like the, the hydroxychloroquine is an RA lupus yeah. drug. And then someone was talking about Rebif as a potential. Yeah. That's great and all, and it, it almost makes it sound like we're better off now, but that's not necessarily the case right. because if we were to get it, being immunocompromised can mean a couple of things, right? It could mean that just because of the drug, we are immunocompromised, our B cells or our T cells are knocked out. But then also the fact that if we still were to get sick, we would be even more at risk because right. we would have these flare-ups in addition to, right? And they're saying that COVID can affect different organs and different parts of the body where you already are at risk. Yeah. So that's not cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I thought about that. I was like, I wonder what happens. We knew some, know of somebody, their friend has lupus. And I was like, wow, that's similar to MS. I mean, you know, they're, they're not the same, of course, but they're similar. The, the point that I'm trying to make is the inflammation. So if you get COVID, I'm sure your whole entire body is inflamed. And that's what happens when we have these flare ups. And so if you're in the hospital, who knows what will happen Your Your whole body may go into a complete exacerbation in addition to you being terribly mm -hmm. sick and coughing and possibly on a ventilator. I know that's what I've heard for, for a lot of people. Yeah. That's definitely the reason why I am just extra cautious. And I know people are still out there. They're socializing, they're visiting people, they're out on the road, taking walks and stuff like that, going out to pick up food. And everyone has their own level of what feels safe for them. But personally, it's extra super cautious because of these things. Yeah. I had a bittersweet experience. So my nephew, one of my nephews, his birthday was... Um, last week or the week before. And, you know, of course we had birthday presents and everything for him and it's, he turned 10. And for a child, I'm sure it, it's sad to have to celebrate your birthday quarantine yeah. during yeah. an epidemic. So anyway, my sister and he and his brother came over. They didn't come in, but we watched him open his the presents that we got him outside through the window. And it was such a sad moment yeah. having to him yeah. through the window. So even though you can be close to people ever so slightly to not be able to reach out and touch and hug the people that you love, it's sad. So anyway, sorry for the aside, but yeah. Oh, it is sad. A sign of the times. Yeah. Birthdays yeah. are a big deal yeah. for, for kids, even for adults. And this is... Yeah. That this is the COVID generation, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Just had mine yesterday and it just felt so uneventful. Oh, happy, like, oh, happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It was just really just kind of, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would love for us to get into this question about what has it been like as a woman of color living with MS in general? What has your experience been like with relation to health? equity uh, living with this condition what has that what has having ms been like for you as a woman of color well for me i guess when i was diagnosed it was all so brand new i didn't 
nobody in my family has MS. We thought my my aunt had it, but we still are not sure because she only had one one case, so it was probably benign. One flare up, I should say, which seemed like an MS flare up, uh, but she never got diagnosed officially. Mm-hmm. When I was diagnosed, when I heard the term autoimmune, I was clueless, and I initially thought, I don't know what this is. Do you mean Parkinson's? Like, am I going to be like Janet Reno? I don't know if you all remember her, but yeah. So that's what my initial thought was. And I didn't see anyone that looked like me. So it was really hard to grasp the whole concept of sickness or MS, autoimmune, and just like being part of a community. I just didn't know what way was up. So it kind of spun me into denial for probably a a little bit over a decade. So I guess I can only, I was, I was lucky because I had a really, really good neurologist from the start. So everyone prior to everyone that I saw prior to her, they didn't ignore my symptoms or ignore me, which is what I've heard over the years from different black women that, you know, oh, I went to my doctor and they told me I, I was stressed out and they just kind of let my symptoms you know, carry on till I've lost function in my arm or whatever. But um, I know that this does happen. I I was just very lucky. And so I can say representation is the only thing that that really yes. stuck out to me. And I'll let Dana take over from there because I know that's yeah. kind of a hot topic for her too. I have a very interesting MS background experience. My mother also has MS. And my aunt, her sister has MS as well. And without getting into the, you know, all of the details of that, my experiences as being black with MS, I don't know. I have a very good neurologist. So I don't know that being a black woman and having MS has really altered or not altered, but influenced my experiences and treatment and things like that. However, as it relates to race, I think, especially when I was first diagnosed back in 2004, I know for Dawn in 2000, there was no representation, hardly any representation in the MS community. MS was seen as a white woman's disease. And so not being able to see your, and again, I was 23 going on 24. Dawn was 25 when she was diagnosed. So, you know, we're still young women. And so the image of people with MS is something that we weren't able to relate to, I guess you could say. So I think the biggest thing is the lack of representation kind of makes you feel even more isolated. And which I think, again, was like more of the impetus for us starting the podcast so that people of color, black women specifically, would hear themselves represented that, hey, we're here too. Um, So, and we talk about it a lot in the podcast, representation matters. And I think that has so many implications um, for, I don't know, people just living life with a chronic illness. And I I find it interesting because Black and Hispanic women, I went to a workshop not too long ago, the presenter, the neurologist was talking about the statistics for black and Hispanic or Latino women. And they are at the highest rate right now of being uh, diagnosed Mm -hmm. with MS. I just kind of like put all the pieces of the puzzle together. And I'm like, okay, I'm missing something. Because how is it that these women of color are being diagnosed at a rapid rate? And more so than any other ethnicity right now. And why are we still just seeing the same images, the same images from like 10, 20 right. years ago? So it's hard to, exactly. to relate to that. I have a particular take on MS just as a researcher. So when I graduated with my doctorate, I decided to go into MS research. Mm -hmm. It's just, I met a neurologist and we just decided, I decided to partner with him at the university so that I can do research with him. I was always interested in autoimmunity in general. And so I met this neurologist and I started to do patient-centered research on technology and MS. And we were finding some really interesting perspectives where it was like somewhere in the 90s, 
of percentages in clinical trials where it was white men in MS who were being included in clinical trials. So not knowing what medications were going to work for different populations, Mm -hmm. different backgrounds, different genders, different genetic predispositions even. We weren't even able to include that in clinical trials. And then also having gone to a public health conference, I believe this one was like three years ago, and this person was talking about an MS study that she was doing, I believe it was in in Chicago or something. And she did like an exercise and MS, like the effectiveness of this intervention. And she only had, I think she had 20 people in it. And two of them, they were black either. Yeah, they were, I think they were all women. And I asked her in that conference about how is it that she only had two people of color? I mean, just out of curiosity, how did she come up with this demographic structure in her study? And she said in the conference in front of everybody that no, it's because MS um, really is a Northern European disease. It does not affect people of color. And, you know, I'm just sitting there, I'm just looking at her like, you don't even know. (laughs) know. I'm totally serious. And so these are the reasons why I got interested in helping the MS population through research. And so I'm somewhat familiar with the different types of medications that are out there and the reason why I'm really passionate about health disparity. And the researcher I was working with, he said the same thing, like in like 98% or so of clinical trials, they do not include people of color. So that's kind of the background is on why I keep asking these types of questions, even though it may not affect us uh, personally, um, the research is missing. Yeah, it's... It's interesting. Well, you know, it's a very complicated and complex issue because on one hand, you know, we need to be advocates for, we need to voice how important it is for Black people to be included in these clinical trials. However, we know that Black people have a horrid history in this country Mm -hmm. as it relates to clinical trials and any sort of with healthcare, period. Think about Tuskegee and, you know, even things, you know, more recent than that. And so Black people are skeptical when it comes to being used as guinea pigs uh, Mm -hmm. in research. And so it complicates things when we're needed for clinical trials. We absolutely are. How are we going to get to where we need to be if we're not including, if we're kind of self-selecting ourselves out? Um, I don't know. It's complicated. We're needed, but we're not trusting. It's difficult to trust healthcare providers because we don't know if you're going to offer us help or if you're going to hurt us. And Mm -hmm. that's just kind of It's just that simple. What if your researcher was someone from your community? Would you trust that research a little different? Or do you have different feelings about the research? That's a really good question. It is. And I think that it does make a difference. There is a phenomenal neurologist, and we've had her on the podcast uh, several times. Her name Mm -hmm. is Dr. Mitzi Williams. She's a Black neurologist out of uh, Georgia. And she focuses a lot on Black people and people of color as it relates to MS. And she focuses on research and, you know, the disparities in research. And so coming, listening to her as a Black woman, that gives you more, for me, that gives me more comfort hearing these things from her Mm -hmm. versus hearing some old white guy from wherever preaching to me about Mm -hmm. these things. It's like, give me a break. No. Right. I think it would make a difference knowing the person, because like you just said, it's instead of preaching, I think Dr. Williams, I I can say it would be more of a teaching situation. Like this is what Mm -hmm. we need for this particular clinical trial. This is why. And then she would go down the list and because she's thorough. So it's much easier to trust someone that you know, or, and that you're familiar with because you know that they're not leading you down the wrong path and that they've they put don't have in, ulterior motives. Exactly. Yeah. And they've put in the re- the time and the research. So yeah, that makes a difference, a big difference. So I think in public health, we have this, there's different approaches, but there's a CBPR, the community-based participatory research. And I know you both have an academic background. There might be some other styles of research where you go in and you gain trust in your community before you even begin right. to begin the project and you actually bring them in, you give them a voice in the process. Mm -hmm. So they're even involved in what you're actually going to be 
studying. They tell you about the emerging problems that are out there, and then basically you have to gain their trust before you can even begin. Right. So, I mean, I'm hoping that. CBPR or related types of research could be an approach that would bring in more diversity in autoimmune and MS clinical trials, even behavioral research, even asking questions or technology usability research for like things like the uh, I Conquer MS patient platform, uh-huh. things like that. Yeah. Definitely, Mm -hmm. definitely. I would love to know more about people that are focusing on the research that will involve people of color in clinical trials. It's important for us to do it. Would I be a part of a clinical trial? Uh, Probably not, but (laughs) right, yeah. But it's good to know who are the heavy hitters in our community that's doing Mm -hmm. it. You know, because they would have my support in, in any way. But absolutely, yeah. In some of the literature with people of color, like, so we're seeing the numbers have changed over time, but there's various reasons for why we're starting to see new diagnoses in various communities. So one is that some doctors may not have considered people to have MS or other diagnoses because of their background in the past. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they're like, oh, wow, we're like the number of people who are diagnosed has doubled in the past two years. I don't know if you've seen that with the NMSS. Um, The number of people calculated to have MS, the prevalence is like double what they thought it was like two years ago. And so it may be that it's new, you know, there could be environmental factors, Mm -hmm. but also it could be just that they weren't even looking for that. And, you know, the frustration in the autoimmune community for the most part is like, you know, a lot of people are like, you don't hear me, you disregarded my pain, my numbness, my fatigue, and it took four to seven years to get a diagnosis. And so what are all the different reasons for that? Yes. And so it's like, is it is it that the number of diag- the number of people uh, with these diseases has increased? Or is it just that the number that you've actually opened your eyes to has increased? Right, exactly. I want to add one more thing about clinical trials and people of color that we tend to have more comorbidities. So yeah. being involved in a clinical trial, focusing, for example, just on MS, would take away from maybe if we had diabetes or rheumatoid yeah. arthritis or something, you know what I mean? So it's scary for us as, and I'll, I'll speak for the community at large. I find that it would be frustrating for people because they're like, okay, you're treating one thing, but what about this other? And it's hard. And that I think contributes tremendously to us just not wanting to get involved in that aspect of healthcare. And it's so layered. I mean, when we talk about comorbidities is it because black people are more predisposed to high blood pressure diabetes genetically no it's not it's because of the way this it's the because structure. of the structural yep. realities of life as a black person yep. or person of color in the united states so it's so complicated mm-hmm. and that too we can totally relate that back to COVID-19 and the disparities that we're seeing about the people who are dying from it at a tremendous level. It's This is all just so layered and complicated and scary and sad. And it really yeah. highlights what's going on here in this country and how we are failing us as people of color and Black people. So that's actually the tangent I kind of wanted to go into next, yeah. asking about health disparities with COVID, what you've seen out there, seen some of the news, um, how it has connected to your feelings, everyday living with autoimmunity and being women of color, being black women, even mm-hmm. what have you seen? How has this affected you, the people that you love? And then like, just seeing this news, what can we do about this? I have a friend that is a nurse. I live in Atlanta. and. When Governor Cuomo called for all hands on deck, basically extra medical staff to come in and help, she jumped and said, I'm going. And once she got there, I said, I'm so nervous for you. How is it? And she said, oh my gosh, it's really bad. (laughs) It's just like, what's going on? She said, well, it's sad because the people who really need this care are not being treated properly. I'm not going to call out hospitals or anything like that or areas of parts of New York, but I just know that she specifically said in the more affluent or upper middle class parts of the city, those people were getting treated rapidly and with better care. And then the ones that were poorer or, you know, in a different socioeconomic class, they 
just weren't getting the proper treatment. And also people weren't necessarily looking at all the issues that they have coming in. You know what I mean? Like they have COVID, but then they have hypertension or high cholesterol or whatever, you know, heart disease or something like that. She said that the disparities were blaring for her and that's been difficult to manage. Of course, she's doing her job and she's treating everyone and she's happy to help and happy to be there. Well, not happy to be there under these circumstances, but Mm -hmm. happy to assist in the, the medical realm. But um, we had this discussion and I was so sad and I, I'm like, wow, are people dying because of it? And, and so she said, this is really why you are seeing the numbers of African-Americans failing t- and to this disease because the treatment. Yeah, that's just right. one take. I'm not saying it's happening all over the country. This is just one small area. So I don't know. That's the yeah. experience that I know about. Yeah. I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. and here in Milwaukee, we are the city, which is a large number of Black people, we're the hardest hit. When it comes to deaths, we are the hardest hit. And Milwaukee is the most segregated city in the United States. So I'll just put that out there. So the disparities that we're seeing as far as Black people dying, it's so layered and complex. Not only are there comorbidities, but why is because Black people are live in areas where there are food deserts and lack of healthcare and things like that. It's so complicated. And it's sort of like, you know, when you hear in these press conferences and everything like that about, oh, you know, talking about the disparities of people of color and Black people, it's like, yes, water is wet. We know that. This is not news. Right. So I guess, like, what do we do about it? You know, I think it really is going to take in a complete overhaul of our society, to be quite honest with you. Like, I think that there is no simple answer to that question. Like, what do we do about it? Because it's all so layered and complex. And it's like, we've got to throw this whole thing away and start over for, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and that sounds dire and extra and extreme, but it's like, we have to get to the root of it mm-hmm. and it's ugly and hard, but that's and just my opinion. No, I, I don't think it sounds hard or ugly, Dana. I really mm-hmm. think it's a major problem here in this country and mm-hmm. globally. And Dana and I were talking when we were preparing for you and this podcast, April, I had read an article about, I don't know, maybe four days ago, a woman in the UK, Kayla Williams, and I'm saying her name because Mm -hmm. people, that's what we have to do. We have Mm -hmm. to say her name. And she is a mother of three. Her husband is a, it says a refuse collector. So I assume like a a trash pickup person. And she said her husband called, or the article said that her husband called 999 and in the UK, they use 999, 999 instead of, yeah, the uh, 911. So they called and they came to the house. But when they treated her or when they saw her, they didn't treat her. And they said, oh, you don't need to go. You'll be fine. And clearly her husband was upset with it in this article. This is what they were saying. And he he said, you know, he tried to keep her calm and, and relaxed and fix her some tea or something. And he went in the kitchen and when he came out, she was slumped over in a chair and she wasn't breathing. And he called 999 again and said, Hey, they just left. And this is what they told us. And that they, they told us that she wasn't priority. That's what they said. She was not priority and that she could stay home. And they never took her to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And that broke my heart reading that article yeah. because it could have been yeah. prevented. And it's like, that could have <gasps> been you. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, that's the sad reality. Like, this could be us. Oh, so, <sighs> yeah. It's a lot. So sorry to bring up these, that's like, tough questions you for you, so all hard. these wick, wick, what we call because wicked problems, asking you, how do we solve it? No, 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 no. <laughs> no but, it, it, but it just, yeah, but that's the they pick and choose. thing. Like, okay, these and are that's the what How do we solve me with, it? Yeah. But, and then, like, having to deal with the fact that, you know what? Like, I don't know if we can. Right. And I am always extra and extreme about things but sometimes you have to be because again like you have to get to the root of things in my opinion Mm -hmm. in order to deal with them and and to be honest with you I don't know if we are ready to do that 
Mm-hmm. And that, that I don't know if this country has ever been ready to mm-hmm. be honest, like from the very foundations, yes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It says, yeah. if I can just read a small quote from this article, it says, when the paramedic arrived at 832 a.m., she carried out some tests, Williams said. Williams is her husband. She told me the hospital won't take her. She is not a priority. I'm so curious. I mean, I would love to know a little bit more about what they meant by that. You know, in the news, I've heard various situations because of the overcrowding of certain emergency rooms that, and it doesn't make any sense. It's like, until you're actually like, basically like dead, they'll come and get you. They're giving up on even calling because they're like, okay, all you're going to do is isolate me and then leave me to die without my family. Yeah. You know, and you've already only picked me up when it's last, last moments you know, last resort. So it doesn't even make sense anymore in some cases yeah. for people even calling mm-hmm. for help. It's like, wow, what do you even say? Yeah, I don't want to end the, the conversation on a sad note, but in terms of like the things we can do, I'm, I'm thinking we can do things at a very small level even, maybe different practices of things that I'm thinking of on my side. What I like to do is building tools for self-efficacy, building tools for mindfulness, and building capacity for proactive responses to things. Mm -hmm. These are ways that I like to try to do my part to try to make public health a better place Mm -hmm. for people. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, you're doing an amazing work with your podcast. Are there things that you would recommend for people to like get through every single day with these challenges and these heavy things with these wicked problems that may or may not resolve in our lifetime? You know, Um, you know, okay. I, I I was going to say, I think people being vocal and making themselves heard yes. is a huge thing. Um, I think people underestimate. I mean, it sounds so simple. Like, yeah, you know, your voice is important, this, that, and the other. But it is. If we stay silent and don't talk about our struggles and the issues that we're facing and, you know, X, Y, and Z, even if it sounds like complaining which that's a whole other issue and topic, but we can't be silent and we have to refuse to be silenced. We have to make our voices heard and be seen. And I think that that's step one, in my opinion. And to piggyback in our previous podcast, we've talked about being your own advocate. I think Mm -hmm. self-advocacy is crucial in this environment, Mm -hmm. not accepting being dismissed. A dismissive attitude from healthcare providers is just not acceptable. If they don't give you an answer, go somewhere else. Ask tons Mm -hmm. of questions because if you don't, then you won't, my grandmother used to say, a closed mouth won't get fed. If you don't ask Mm -hmm. the right questions or if you don't even ask questions, then you won't know. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. You know, it's just our ways of various ways of coping Mm -hmm. with these circumstances with the pandemic, with autoimmunity, with racism in this country. Right. Tell me what you look forward to as things, let's say we find a vaccine. What's the first thing that you're going to do? I think the first thing that I would do, uh, well, my 40th birthday is on May 19th. And we're going to still be quarantined. Obviously, this thing isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But I think as soon as something happens, a vaccine is found, treatment and things, I think I'm going to organize a 40th birthday celebration in person so I can give my people Definitely a should, yeah. 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 So I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm good. I'm going to hug my son and take him go-kart racing because he missed that for his birthday party. So we're going to do that. Yes. Yep. Looking forward to the future. Yes. Because yes. this Thanks. too shall pass. That's we right. don't know when and where, that's... but it will. And yes, that's the bottom. So how can we connect with you ladies? How can we access your podcast, your website? How can we get in contact with you on social media? So our website is www.myelinandmelanin.com. Um, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Myelin Melanin, no and. And you can always check us out on YouTube. Yeah. What else, Don? We're super active on Instagram. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Go Come check you. us out. And the podcast could be streamed everywhere that you find podcasts Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those places. But yeah, come check us out, people. 
And then in closing, is there any advice you would like to give out there? Any kind of um, message that you'd like to share as we close? Stay safe. <laughs> yes. Wear stay a mask. Safe. Yeah. Wear a mask. Keep your peace in whatever way that's good for you. Just try to stay sane and stay peaceful and stay mindful. Yeah. yeah stay safe. Stay isolated and stay and healthy. <laughs> treat yourself to something nice every day. Whether it's yes. just a bowl of ice cream or a good movie, a bath, something. Yes. I love that. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.